Welcome to the Divorce Survival Guide podcast, where we have open and honest conversations about co-parenting, separation, divorce, and the hardest question of all, should you stay or should you go? I'm Kate Anthony, your Divorce Survival Guide, and I'm here to help you navigate some of the roughest waters you've ever swum in and answer some of your toughest questions. I've been to hell and back, and now it's my mission in life to help you get to the other side of this process with your sanity and your heart intact. Hey everyone, today's a big one. Seriously, <laughs> I think my guest needs very little introduction in these uh, in these parts, but um, for those of you who don't know, Lundy Bancroft is the author of five books in the field, um, including the national prize winner, The Batterer as Parent. Why does he do that? Which I think almost <laughs> all of you have read. When Dad Hurts Mom, Daily Wisdom, and Should I Stay or Should I Go? He has worked with over a thousand abusers directly as an intervention counselor, and has served as clinical supervisor on another thousand cases. He's also served extensively as a custody evaluator, child abuse investigator, and expert witness in domestic violence and abuse cases. Lundy appears across the United States as a presenter for judges and other court personnel, child protective workers, therapists, law enforcement officials, and other audiences. And I am so incredibly honored that Lundy joined me um, on the podcast today. And it's an incredible conversation. And I'm not even going to say any more because I just want you to listen to the wisdom that is Lundy Bancroft. Lundy Bancroft, <laughs> I am so happy to have you on the show today. I can't even tell you. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. All right. So we really want to dive in and talk about, you know, what happens when you get separated and you have been with an abuser, is it over? <laughs> right? And what can we expect? One place to start with that, I think, is just to talk about what the abusive man's orientation is towards a breakup. And unfortunately, fundamentally, he he wants payback. He he's like a, the abusive man is a is a kind of collector of grievances, a collector of debts. And of course, it's always on his side. It's always like what you owe him. And right. so he he wants to collect on that. And if you're the one that broke up with him, then that just adds to his list of grievances because the abuser mentality is like you had no right to leave him because of this. Yeah, it's the entitlement. Yeah, he's very entitled mm -hmm. about that. You know, I did this for you. I did this for you. I did this for you. It doesn't matter that he took 90 you know, nine times as much as what he received, it's, it's still always going to be like, you owe me, you owe me. And, uh, mm -hmm. and he, he takes it like a real personal affront that you're breaking up with him. But even if the breakup was mutual, or even if he was really sort of the one that pushed for breakup, he still feels like he's angry from this old balance sheet of his about things that he, you know, thinks you owed him more on. So he's kind of revenge oriented. He also is very invested typically in convincing everybody that he was the good one and you were the bad one and that he was the fair one. You were the unfair one. He was the reasonable one. You were the unreasonable one. And so he often therefore pours a lot of energy into working friends, working relatives. If you've got professionals involved because you've got custody or something, you know, working those people. And he wants like, he wants like a societal stamp of approval. He wants this message that like, see, people in general are agreeing that, that there was nothing wrong with what I was doing, that you were, you know, using unfair words against me when you were saying I was bossy or domineering or abusive or whatever those words were, mean, disrespectful, whatever you may have called me, that was all totally unfair. And, and I'm, and I'm going to win this because people are going to end up preferring me. And, and unfortunately he can have some success with that because he, sometimes, because he's so manipulative and he, because he, you know, goes on and on and on and people feel sorry for him. And, and then if you have children with him, then he really wants 
the children to prefer him. And he's sometimes willing to go to some considerable lengths to then be able to say, then he can say not only to himself, but he can even say to other people. And he loves that. He loves to be able to say to other people, oh, and the children say now that they want to live with me or the children are actually staying with me more now than they stay with her. That to him is such a triumph. And it's that seal of approval. It's like, see, see, I wasn't, there wasn't anything wrong with how I was treating her. She, She was the bad one. You know, and so often I find with my clients, right, <clears throat> they want to correct the narrative, right? And, I, and I'll say to them, like, there's you have no control over what he's going to say, right? And you're each going to have a completely different narrative when it comes down to it, right? You're going to have completely different narratives. And I sort of encourage my clients to sort of back off, allow him to have his narrative. You're not going to be able to change it or control it. And you can have yours, but you know, you can't then go toe to toe on the narrative, right? Because then it's like, right? Like, what do you do about you know, that? And, and I mean, one of the points that's very hard to accept, and I totally get why it's hard to accept, I'm totally with you on why it's hard to accept, is that uh, he's going to continue to see things the way he sees them, his distorted, selfish way of seeing things. And he's going to continue to frame it that way to other people. And when he gets you, when he succeeds in drawing you into fighting about that narrative, that feeds him. You think, oh, if I say this to him and this to him and this to him, because you you know you're constructing these arguments in your brain. We all do that, and when we've been victims of injustice, we create arguments in our brain. That's totally natural. That's not even unhealthy. Totally. You know, that's fine to be doing that. But then when we take those arguments to him, and we think, oh, this time it's going to be like there's. He's going to, it's just, it's just going to show him like if this argument's going to be so well made that there's just no way out of it for him. It's like, first of all, he always has a way out of it. But, but secondly, uh, it feeds him like even your great, even your excellent arguments feed him because he wants you engaged with him so that he can, so that he can say more mean stuff to you. Right. He's just one. Right. Just you engaging in this conversation, in this narrative, in this argument means that he's now he's won. He's got he's got you back in control. Unfortunately, it's true. And so that part of you that that wants to make him see, which is totally a healthy part of you, but not if you act on it. You have to not act on that urge. Uh, because that will play into his hands. That that part of us that right. craves justice, that's a good thing. But when we go trying to demand it in places where there's zero chance we're going to get it, then we're just hitting our heads against the wall and we end up hurting only ourselves. And right. it's, I, I just want to say, I'm so sympathetic. I've been there in situations of injustice, not, you know, obviously I haven't dealt, dealt with, you know, an abusive man, but I've, you know, dealt with other kinds of injustice in my life. You know, you have a right to be heard and you have a right to get to argue about the injustice that was done. But you want to make sure you're not doing it in a way that's actually hurting you. And when you take it to the abuser, that's that's just the wrong place to take it because he's he will always, from his perspective, he will he will always get what he wants. Let's put it that way. He will always get what he wants out of that mm-hmm. interaction. And you won't. You will come out feeling rotten every right. time, almost every time. Right. And that much further away from justice. That's right. Right. Because, and I often say to my clients as well that, you know, when you you know, we love to, we get, we get physically divorced, we get legally divorced, right? And we have to also get emotionally divorced because when we don't, this is what happens. We're still in the dynamic. We're in the exact same power and control dynamic if we're still trying to convince them of the, of the injustice. And for example, I see women a fair bit who are just being upset five times a day by texts that they're getting from their ex. And I say, why haven't you blocked him? And it's like, well, because then I won't know what he's saying. And and I again, I totally understand that reaction, but it is really important to let go because it will it will just take a mounting toll on you over over the over the weeks and months and years. It's just going to take more and more and more out of you. And and it keeps you having to think about him all day, which is exactly what he wants. He wants you to have to think about him all day. And you have to find mm-hmm. a way to clear space to think about yourself and think about your kids and think about your own life and where you're going. 
which is what he doesn't want you to be able to do. So block, block, block exactly. those texts. Block them and and use a co-parenting app. If you really want, if you need to be in touch about the about your kids, then great. Use a co-parenting app where you know the your your attorneys can see the, the interactions, where they know they're being watched, right? Because they love to look like the hero publicly, yeah. right? right? And and if not, you have uh you have at least documentation. Right. And you're and you don't have to respond to something five times in theory, at least if you're using you know, my family wizard or whatever those things are called. In theory, you're not obligated mm-hmm. to be responding to something five times a day. You know, if you say, well, I checked it once a day or I check it every two days. Okay. So, you know, I want to sort of move into <laughs> what happens then when we get into custody disputes, because the family court system, I mean, talk about injustice. <laughs> so, so first of all, the the common public perception is half a century literally out of date of what's going on in the custody courts. And people say, oh, the custody courts are just, you know, the mother just gets custody no matter what. And it's actually, when you look at the historical record, it's not clear that that was ever true, but it it was a much, uh, a mother had a much better chance 50 years ago. But the, the maternal preference has literally been gone for 40 years. And there's just this huge time lag in society of, uh, for people to realize that it's gone. And and the maternal preference actually only applied to quite young children anyhow. That never applied to teenagers. And or even, yeah, even even older elementary school age kids, the maternal preference didn't exactly apply to. But anyhow, it's long gone. It's literally 40 years gone. Uh, but the but the the abusers who form these f- what they call fathers' rights organizations, and I'm happy to say more about those because those organizations are very mis- misperceived. They're abuser organizations. They are. And, yes, I would love to talk about and, that. <laughs> we'll come back around uh, to that. Those organizations just keep drumming into people's ears 365 days out of the year. The custody courts are just, you know, totally anti-father. And it's the mother, everything, the mother, everything. That's they, they, The people who are saying that have never experienced that because it's been gone for 40 years. So they're not old enough to have experienced that. And <laughs> right. The, mm-hmm. But they just drum at it and drum at it and drum at it. And it's one of those things where, well, if you say it enough times, it must be true, which is what abusers specialize in anyhow, is f- f- feeling like mm-hmm. if you tell a lie enough times, that's going to make people start to feel that it's true. So so that's the first thing that is really important for moms to understand is that the that maternal advantage, to the extent that it ever existed, is long gone. And we now have a court that is really interested in favoring the parent that's got more money. And that's Mm. overwhelmingly going to be the father. And particularly when there's a history of abuse, it's almost always going to be the father because the abuser manipulates things financially, economically. I mean, that's part of how the abuse works is the financial stuff that he does. So the that normal disadvantage that women typically have statistically for at least the first two years after divorce, they say a woman is at a disadvantage on average in a divorce. That's going to be even more true in a divorce where you're divorcing an abuser. And so the the first thing folks need to be aware of going into family court is that it's going to be important to tread very carefully and very strategically because you're walking into a minefield. So how do we do that? The first thing is, if possible, find a lawyer who understands why you're worried about your children. Because unfortunately, the typical attorney is really focused on assets when it comes to divorce. And when a woman says, I'm really concerned about my kids, the attorney will tend to say, well, does he beat your kids? It's like, well, no, he hasn't generally beat them. Well, is he like, Sexually abusing your children? Well, I'm not completely sure, but I don't think, as far as I can tell, he's not outright sexually abusing them. He does seem to flirt with the girls in ways that I don't like, but he's not exactly sexually abusing them as far as I know. And then the attorney's like, so what are you worried about? And she's saying, well, he's vicious. He's been vicious to me for years. He's done it right in front of the kids. That's obviously terrible for the kids. He's out to turn the kids against me. That's obviously terrible for the kids and terrible for me. He drives dangerously. He, he, you know, he drinks too much sometimes. He doesn't pay, a lot of times he just doesn't pay attention to what the kids are doing and he's reckless and they get into dangerous situations. And the lawyer's like, uh, you know, that's not, that's just not, 
that's just not our area. Yeah, you know, that's not child abuse. That's like, and lawyers a lot of times start to sound almost like they're his, your lawyer, the woman's lawyer often starts to almost sound like he, the, he or she is there for the father. We'll start to say things like, well, you know, he's the father. He has the right to be involved. And it's like, I never said he didn't have the right to be involved. I'm trying to say I'm worried about my kids. <laughs> oh, you know, children need their father and all this stuff. And they, and you never said you never said otherwise. So people say, oh, so-and-so is a really good divorce lawyer. That's not really what you need. What you need is a lawyer mm -hmm. who understands divorcing an abuser and particularly who yeah. understands a circumstance where your primary concern is your kids and and not just who's going to win custody but like their safety and well-being you know like what's the visitation plan going to be and how you know so that's a challenge and and I really recommend people talk to two three four different lawyers and try to find someone who actually really seems to be careful capable of caring about your kids and getting why you might worry Consider, if you have a strong personality, consider representing yourself. Uh, mm. Some people will tell you, oh, don't go in there without a lawyer, you'll get eaten alive. And the thing is that it is better to have a good lawyer than to go in representing yourself. But it's better to go in representing yourself than to go in with a lawyer who doesn't get it or who's kind of a bad lawyer or who's irresponsible. And I've just been listening for 20 years to women's stories about the terrible handling of their cases by their own attorneys. You know, the, the other yeah. side being the other being, you know, also a huge part of the problem. But just things like, oh, my lawyer told me that she or he would file a motion that never got filed or she and he you know, claims to have done so or said that she or he would file an appeal and never did it. And now the deadline for appeal is passed. And if you go and say, well, my lawyer said they were fil filing an appeal but they didn't do it. It doesn't matter. A deadline for an appeal is an absolutely firm deadline. You miss it. It's gone. Yeah. And, and in terms of like representing yourself, I mean, part of, you know, part, I think that that some of the issue, um, correct me if I'm wrong, is that, I mean, even with an attorney, right, is that with, with an attorney who doesn't understand coercive control, right, because we're looking the court is still somewhat black and white in these areas. Does he hit you? Has he, is he sexually abusive, right? These are the tangible things. These are the things that we can have medical records for. We have hospital visits, right? But when it comes to emotional abuse and coercive control and psychological, you know, torture, it's not tangible, right? There's, it's not evidentiary. We don't have. We, it, you're not going to tend to have independent evidence, although any court that cared to find out enough still could. So I'm not willing to let them off the hook. And I'm not saying you were doing that either. But 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 the no. reason I emphasize that is because uh, so many judges have said to me, because I've done a lot of training for judges over the years, not that it's done any good, but that I've had a lot of judges say to me, well, you know, a lot of these cases are just his word against hers. And that's just rot. It's like if you wanted to bother to read emails, to look at texts, to actually talk to school personnel, to actually talk to the kids, to actually talk, not just ask them who they want to live with, but like actually ask them intelligent questions, you can find out. I mean, I used to do custody evaluations for, for a few years. I was a guardian ad litem in Massachusetts. I could find out what I wanted to know. You just had to put in the effort. When people say, oh, you know, like psychological cruelty, that's that's so amorphous. I mean, I understand your point, which is that it's not going to be like documented in some kind of clear way. You're absolutely right about that. But you want to find out if there's if if there's if one person's had a pat pattern of cruelty and domination, you can find it out if you make the slightest effort. Yes. And I'm going to like, <laughs> I'm not pushing back at you because like, I'm like, I'm so with you on this. Right. But currently we're dealing with, on the, you know, playing out on the international stage with Johnny Depp and Amber Heard where because what tends to happen is that victims of abuse tend to not act very well sometimes because they're out of their goddamn minds. And so, you know, you sh there's plenty of, there's pl plenty, there might be, you know, a history of texts of him berating her, but she's going to be pushing back in some way. And then they're, the judge is still going to say, well, look, it's still, they're both behaving terribly. That is very, very frustrating. The way that logic just gets abandoned is very, very frustrating. I mean, it happens in the Johnny Depp case where it's just like, there's just all these smoke screens going up. It's like, wait a minute, what is 90% of this discussion has nothing to do with the allegations against him. If we're just focused on right? what's the evidence, what are the indications that he actually did what she's saying he did? 
Well, wow, it's pretty, pretty persuasive if you look at it at all carefully and objectively, and if you don't just get right. fooled by all these smoke screens. But no, you're absolutely right. Yeah. The abuser is so good at muddying the waters. And although, again, the court is also very good at allowing him to do that. So he'll do right. things like say, well, let's have psych evals. And by and large, an abused woman is going to test as having more emotional problems than an abuser does when they're psych evals. Histrionic personality disorder in Amber Heard's case, and, right? And, <laughs> of course she does. Histrionic personality disorder is classic. And histrionic personality disorder is, is the diagnosis used to say you exaggerate what's happened to you. And then it's used to say that the allegations you're making are not true. So it's what, it's what you right. call a completely logical, illogical, but a, a logical circle where you're saying, well, mm-hmm. well, how do you know she's got histrionic personality disorder? Well, because she's making all these false allegations. Well, how do you make know that those allegations are false? Well, because she's histrionic. It's like, wait, 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 wait. that's not, it's not logical to say, well, we know this because of this and we know this because of this. And it's just, and they, they point back at each other. It's like, well, could we right. please just look at the evidence? <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Could we please, <laughs> everybody? Well, since, since I mentioned the psych eval thing, though, I will just go ahead and say yeah. that abusiveness is not primarily a mental health problem. And you can look at the guy and think, oh, my God, he's crazy because he looked when he's at his meanest, he looks so crazy. But that's oppressiveness not a mental health problem. And those are two different things. Oppressiveness, like what makes someone a crazy racist or what makes someone a crazy homophobe uh, or what makes someone hate immigrants. Those aren't mental health problems. There are a lot of people who are unfortunately psychologically and totally normal and would even be defined as psychologically well, who are full of hatred because that's what they were carefully taught to feel towards certain groups of people. And the abuser is someone who's been carefully taught, not necessarily to hate women in general, but to hate any woman that he's involved with. And actually, I wrote a piece a year or maybe two years ago, like, why does why does he hate you? And mm. where I went in to try to explain why, why the mentality of the abuser ultimately leads to hatred. It's not because of his psychology. It's because of his mentality. And so there is no diagnosis for the domestic abuser, no correct diagnosis. And he generally does well on psych tests. And the psychological testers are not good when it comes to testing the woman because their tests are not, have never, they don't have a history of being trauma informed. And so they're not going to distinguish a problem that you have because you were terrified yesterday to a problem that you've had from 40 years from childhood. Like they'll just, they're going to, those are both going to come out looking the same thing. Like, whoa, she's really reactive. So the sad outcome is that with occasional exceptions, but the, the, the great majority of the time in cases that I've been involved in, dozens of cases, uh, the abuser outperforms the abused woman on psychological about testing and evaluation. So I don't recommend going in there pushing for psych evals. There's this real hope of like, oh, if we get psychologically evaluated, they're going to see that I'm okay. And they're going to see how abusive he is. And unfortunately, that's not true. Psych evals are not going to catch his abusiveness. And they will find ways to find things wrong with you, partly just because you're so wounded by what he's done, but partly because they want to find those things and they will, because you can find things about anybody if you want to. Well, I'm going to go back to you representing yourself in this, right? Because I've always, I've said to, I've said that if you're going to, that that you have to find an attorney, like you said who's really informed in all of this. And if not, it's your job to educate the court as you represent yourself, right? So how would one do that? And and one thing I'll just say quickly too, is that there are a fair number of judges, unfortunately, who don't even really want to hear from the parties. And so if you're represented and you try to say something, the judges are saying, no, no, I only want to hear from the attorneys. Not all judges do that, but I've sat in court while a judge like literally said, shh, to to a woman, female judge said, shh, to a woman as she started to talk and said, and then went on to say, I'm only hearing from the attorneys. One of the many advantages of representing yourself is you get to speak because you are the attorney when you're representing yourself. You can turn uh, published articles in with with paperwork. And I really encourage doing that, particularly things that are from respected journals, from peer reviewed journals. 
You can put on experts, and I know some experts are very expensive, but you can find experts that aren't that expensive, aren't that expensive uh, in the domestic violence realm. Expert testimony just puts the judge under some additional pressure, and it puts the other side under some additional pressure. And it also will somewhat encourage the other side to settle. When they hear you're going to be putting on an expert, they're a little more likely to settle with you. The, and you know, very few cases in divorce go actually go to trial. There's the threat of trial is always right. looming there, but it doesn't get there very often. The court doesn't want trials. And the parties don't usually want trials because it's just insanely expensive. Uh, oh, another thing about representing yourself is that the abuser really gets a uh, satisfaction off of driving the woman into severe debt. And if you are representing yourself, he's not, he knows that he's not having nearly this, nearly the same ability to impoverish you. If every time he takes you to court, he knows that's costing you a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars for each court date. Well, he loves that. His temptation to be dragging you constantly into court is somewhat less if he knows that it's not costing you that much. The the thing for representing yourself is that you want to to sound reasonable, but not cold. And this is hard to do. You can do it, but it's hard to do. That sexism is very intense in the courts to this day, you, even with mm-hmm. a female judge. The, the the sexism is still very intense. Oh yeah. And the expectation from a female is that she should be just exactly the right amount emotional. If you're unemotional. They cast you as cold and calculating. If you're quite emotional, then they cast you as his histrionic. And mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. you're on a really tight leash where you have to look just the right amount, just a tiny bit emotional. And it's hard to do. It's hard to do. Yep. But that, that's what you yep. want to reach for. And you want to really come off as someone who wants to reach agreements. And and uh, you want your ex still involved in your children's lives, even if it even if it makes you vomit to say that you need to say it. And, and even if you know that's not what's best for your kids, you need to say it. And you need to say, I just want reasonable precautions and I want him to get in the right services and I want him to deal with his abusiveness. So he stops hurting my children through his efforts to hurt me. One of the messages we want to keep getting through in court is. He's hurting my children out of his desire to hurt me because the court will keep saying, oh, well, you know, he clearly loves his children. And, you're, and you keep saying, I'm not arguing that he loves his children. I'm, I'm not sure he loves his children. I'm saying he hurts them out of his desire to get at me. And that's why we need him in a, in a batter intervention program, which is what they call the abuser programs. And, and that's why, you know, we need his visitation restricted until he does the program. And, and the program isn't going to work any magic, but it, could sometimes have some effect. The main thing is it just gives your kids more time <laughs> to get stronger and get older and get less vulnerable to him. And I love that wording, Lundy. I think it's so it's so great, right? That he's that he's hurting his kids out of his desire to hurt me because so often, you know, a judge will say, you know, he's not he didn't abuse the kids. He's not, you know, he, you know, he sure he may have hit you or maybe, you know, he may have done these things to you, but he's a, but he's a great dad. And this is one of the great myths that you can abuse children's mother and be a great dad. That's, that's actually logically impossible because impossible because because (laughs) abusing your children's mother is one of the worst things you can do for your children. So it's actually logically impossible to abuse children's mother and still be a good father because abusing their mother is in itself terrible fathering. And there, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> there's research up. There's peer-reviewed, published research up to the ceiling, telling us mm. that an abuser who never touches his children is doing terrible harm to them just through what he's doing to mom. It's upsetting to me that the court and, and the attorneys and the abuser himself and all these other people say, "Well, yeah, he may have done some bad things to mom, but he's a really good father." I'm just saying back to exactly what you already said, Kate. Uh, it's it's just a logical impossibility. But then you got the additional point here that if he's capable of doing something that's that harmful to his children, what are the chances that that's the only thing he's doing <laughs> that's harmful to his children? How many destructive parents, yeah. how many really destructive parents, like parents who seriously hurt their children, do it in only one way? Nobody, nobody I've ever met 
And, right. and sure enough, the, the statistics tell us that men who abuse women are a, a far greater risk to children physically, sexually, and psychologically, and all well established in the research. And so we want to say both things. We want to say that already is terrible fathering just because of what he's doing to mom. But we also want to say the research actually says that the single best predictor of how a man will treat children is how he treats their mother. It's in the research. And now for a quick word from our sponsor, the all new fully revised, should I stay or should I go? After three years of this program existing in the world and changing women's lives, I decided to give it a full makeover. The all new version has all new videos, a podcast like audio stream if you wanna take the work on the go, and completely updated resources for deepening your learning. The program consists of six core modules, the first of which is Who Are You? This is the section in which you dig deeply into your own personal development and get in touch with your inner guide, slay your inner critics, mine for values, and learn how to set healthy boundaries. The second module is how you learn to love and helps you understand your attachment style, love languages, and how to properly love and care for the most important person in all of this, yourself. Module three is called, Why Are Women So Exhausted? And breaks down some of the issues around toxic masculinity and male entitlement, the myth of being a stay-at-home mom, and answers the question, he's fine, why can't I just be happy? Module four is all about understanding abuse and includes videos on trauma bonds, understanding the cycles of abuse, particularly how they play out in your own relationship, and addresses addiction, infidelity, and mental illness. Module five is all about healing and moving forward and includes videos about therapy, couples therapy, healing from betrayal, emotional regulation, and grief. This section also includes my 90-minute workshop, Tackling Codependence, as well as my signature relationship inventory that will help you gain complete clarity on all the parts of your marriage and figure out what's his and what's yours. And module six answers the question, is the grass really greener on the other side? With in-depth videos on dating, cultural and religious isolation, and what happens if you end up alone forever? Spoiler, you probably won't. Whether you decide to stay or go, this program will set you up for a lifetime of clarity and fulfillment. And if you've already decided to go, the program will help you unpack all that's happened and help you heal so that you can move forward without repeating the same mistakes that got you here in the first place. This program is priced super low at just $697. And if you use the code PODCAST, when you check out, you'll get $50 off the full price. What are you waiting for? You have been agonizing with this decision for long enough. It's time to finally know, should you stay or should you go? And now back to our episode. It feels so like it's so stacked against us, right? You know, we know that judges are by and large not required or interested in being trained in domestic violence advocacy. They don't understand it. They're overwhelmingly very sort of old school, as you've said. Some of the things that come out of their mouth are so, so 1972. So like, what do we, what do we do? So, so there's two levels and I'm not sure which level you're asking about, or maybe, or probably you're asking about them both. The, so, but you can tell me if I'm off. So on, on the level of, so, so there's the level of, you know, how a woman can increase the chance of her case going as well as possible. And then there's the level yeah. of, how do we bring about broad-based family court reform? Like how do we take this system down nuts and bolts and rebuild it? The, with, with respect to her own case, the, you know, there's, there's lots to say, but a, but a few key points. Um, one is, yeah, to keep, to keep pushing for settlement, keep pushing, you know, I just reason, you know, I'm, I'm the reasonable one. I just want reasonable precautions. I want reasonable protections for my kids. I want my kids to have counselors. I just want, you know, I want their teachers involved. I, you know, I just want reasonable things in place and uh, try to wait for him to get sick of it because 
the the a certain number of abusers fortunately do lose interest over time and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and there's no guarantee but some do so it's that's worth working for the he may get tired or he may get get in a new relationship where he mostly wants to focus on that that can cut both ways because sometimes the new relationship becomes the reason why you know he wants to show the new woman what a great dad he is thing so that can cut either way but sometimes that helps sometimes he moves away i mean different things can happen so Mm-hmm. So think long term and focus on keeping your relationship with your kids as strong as possible, because what he's going to be trying to do as the years go by is he's going to be looking for cracks in your relationship with your kids. And every relationship has cracks. Even the best relationships have cracks. He's going to be looking for the cracks and trying to drive big wedges in there. And so that you need to work hard on resolving conflicts with your children, on being affectionate with them, on being close to them, on keeping criticism to a minimum. And of course, we have to raise some issues with our kids, but try to keep criticism to a minimum. Remember to have fun with them. Try not to make everything about like rules. I mean, I know you have to have rules. And in fact, your rules are particularly important because they don't have enough rules at his house. The, the so ironic, the abuser is like so domination and control oriented, except that as soon as he's got the kids, he lets go of all that because he wants to be in good with them and control mm-hmm, in a different mm-hmm. way. He wants to undermine, he wants to yeah. undermine your parenting. So I understand that you have to have some structure in your house since his house lacks structure, but try not to let everything become about structure. Be, try to be able to really laugh with your kids and uh, try to let them be allowed to have grievances about you. Try to train them how to raise their grievances about you respectfully. Because because kids will say, oh, well, we're not allowed to ever complain about you. It's like, yes, you are. But you have to bring it up in a thoughtful, decent way. You don't get to call me names. You don't get to roll your eyes and walk out of the room and all that kind of uh, really immature behavior. You, you do. You can disagree with me about stuff. You can call me out about stuff that you think I've done wrong, but you're going to have to do it in a decent way. And if kids discover that they're actually allowed to have complaints about mom, as long as they raise them respectfully, that's going to be really different than dealing with dad because you cannot get anywhere raising grievances with an abuser as, a, as his kid. And they're going to notice the difference. So you want to go for, for, a, for a firmness that's also kind of gentle and try mm-hmm. to make that a higher priority than the legal battle because mm. the court is going to largely do things wrong. That's just the way the custody court is. It'll occasionally get some things right, but it's going to largely get them wrong. And so the court's not going to be your best protection. The court will help you sometimes, but a lot, to a great extent, the custody court will not. And your best protection is going to be the strength of your relationship with your children. And so that actually needs to be your number one priority. And one thing that worries me a lot is that litigation gets so consuming. You can't sleep at night. You're thinking about it all day long. You've got a court date coming up in two or three weeks. And all you can think about is getting ready for that court date. And you're not having a good time with your kids because you're tense and you're preoccupied and you're reading the documents. And and the reality is the hearing that you go into really well prepared doesn't really go usually any better than the hearing you go into kind of ill prepared. The it's, mm. it, it makes sense to go somewhat prepared, but not to prepare a ton. It, it's the courts aren't based on what's reasonable so that you're preparing all these things based on the assumption that they're going to proceed in a reasonable way and they won't. So make that. Don't make it a 10th priority, but do knock it down to second priority. And first priority mm-hmm, has to be mm-hmm. the quality of your time with your kids. And I see with abusers, when kids have fun with mom and mom is physically affectionate with them and mom encourages them to really be loving with each other and to not be mean to each other and to have each other's backs. Uh, oh, another thing, and this is true for parenting in general, not just for parenting in this situation, but one of the mistakes that I made as a parent, and this has nothing to do with abuse, but is that I at, did too much kind of being the judge when there was conflict between my kids. Like my kids would be having a conflict mm. and I would listen to the two sides and be like, the, okay, I rule in your favor kind of thing. And that's <laughs> right. a mistake. I didn't realize what a mistake I was mm-hmm. making, but that's a mistake. You really have to help your kids learn how to fight things out for themselves in a fair, decent way and reach their own. In fact, my kids finally had to tell me, dad, you need to let us have our own fights. And uh, <laughs> the, the, it, but that's extra true when dad's an abuser, because if you help kids be able to work out their own conflicts, then he's going to have not only less success turning you against them, 
He's going to have less success dividing them against each other. And when I see these families where moms and mom and the kids have really stayed together and the kids have mom's back and mom has the kids back and siblings have each other's back, the abuser tends to have so much less success at Mm -hmm. getting kids to come live with him, you know, because he wants to do stuff like as soon as you turn 16, oh, I'll buy you a car if you come live at my house. That's a classic right. abuser mentality. I mean, maneuver. You're, they're mm-hmm. tied with their mom. That maneuver goes nowhere. They're like, what? You think yeah. I want to live with you in order to have a car compared to living with mom? Forget you. Yes. And I think to your point, this is a long game right. issue, right? right. Where, where ultimately, if we train our children or raise our children with empathy and to be discerning and to resolve conflict in healthy manners, all of these things, then you're raising kids who, as they grow up, will start to notice the difference and be able to discern between what's happening at mom's house and what's happening at dad's house and how how they're really different and that one feels really good and one feels really bad. And I think that's one of the things we most want is we want them to start uh-huh. to really be aware of that contrast that you're describing. Like this is two really, really different environments. And if I could make a couple of uh, quick book plugs here. So I wrote a book called When Dad Hurts Mom that is full. It's the only book I know of for for moms, for abused moms, that's, that gives actual suggestions, like pages and pages and pages, of like try this, try this. The chapter after chapter ends with a section called What Can I Do? Almost all the chapters end with a section called What Can I Do? That'll give you a bunch of ideas about things to try with your kids. And my other book, The Batterer's Parent, is crazy expensive. When Dad Hurts Mom is not. When Dad Hurts Mom is like a regular priced, you know, just normal price book. The Batter's Parent is like yeah. an academic, okay. it's like a trade, what do they call it? Professional book. And it's just, it's insane. It's $90 in paperback. So forget the batter. Oh my forget God. Forget the batter. Unless you're, <laughs> unless you're in court and you need like the legal arguments and stuff, forget the Batter's Parent. The key ideas from that are all in When uh-huh. Dad Hurts Mom. And, and then okay. my most recent book is a novel. And it's entertaining. It's, it's, you know, I wrote it to be fun to read. It's a, it's a suspense novel. It's got romance in it. It's in the early stages. It's got a fair bit of humor in it. It does get heavy. And I like to give people kind of a trigger alert. It does get heavier, deeper into the book. It's called In Custody. And it's a, it's a, a novel about this young journalist, uh, Carrie Green, very, very inexperienced journalist who is looking into why what's happened to a mother and a daughter that have disappeared. And she stumbles into a whole bunch of kind of uh, secret world, including she learns about the the corruption and anti-mother bias that's happening in the custody courts. Because the mother who has disappeared was involved in a, in a custody battle with with a pretty bad news guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the, I wrote that book, partly to be an entertaining way for people to learn about how anti-mother the custody courts have become. Uh, But so far, moms who read it are saying that they're not finding it too, too triggering. It has some triggering aspects, but they're saying that it depends. You know, if you're really fresh in it, you might not want to read the book. But but by and large, women are saying that it's enough entertainment and enough humor that they're getting through it okay. And, and uh, so far, I haven't any, had anybody say, oh, gee, I really wish I hadn't read that. Um, but, <laughs> but, but, you know, if you're at the worst of a custody battle right now, I don't recommend it. It might be a little, it could be a little heavy for you if you're in the midst. Yeah. Yeah. It's in my, it's in my Kindle queue. I'm very excited to start it. <laughs> before we, before we go, I, I want to, let's talk a, a minute about, well, two things actually. What do we do from a broad perspective? Like, you're right. Those were my two questions. <laughs> what do we do? Uh, first of all, I'll say that while you're in the midst of a custody battle, it's hard to be thinking about social change. Like, I'm going to go out and become an activist and march in the streets and change the world. And that's, and that's completely understandable. You, 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 I understand why right now you got to just focus on, Absolutely. Just focus on your own survival and focus on your kids. But on Mm -hmm. the other hand, what happens is that once that battle eases up enough that there is some space, the mom is usually tired and we're exhausted, just wants to enjoy her children. And so then who's going to carry the banner? 
And it's mm -hmm. the experience of the past kind of 20 plus years of efforts to fight for custody rights for moms. It's not working unless moms themselves are really the ones carrying the banner. So we're going to have to find a way to really have more protective mothers, mothers, you know, who are, who, who have divorced an, or have left an abuser uh, in, in the real positions of leadership in this effort. And then the, and the rest of us, people like me who want to be allies have important roles to play. Allies have an important role to play too, but we, we're really going to have to have moms at the forefront and we're going to have to develop good systems for how to take care of people emotionally while they do that. The places that people typically put their hope don't work. And I'll, I'll, I'll say what I mean by that. And I'm not hopeless. I'll tell you where I do put my hope in a minute. But where people typically put their hope is in passing better laws and in tr doing better training for judges and custody evaluators. And neither of those works. They're, a total, they're an almost total failure. Uh, the passing laws don't work because the judges in custody court don't care what the law is. And almost no litigators in a, in a, who, almost no one who's leaving an abuser has resources for an appeal. Mm -hmm. So they are not afraid of the appeals court. You know, criminal court judges are really concerned about being appealed. Right. They, family court judges are not. They know that they are rarely going to get appealed and they just don't worry about appeal very much. And when they do get appealed, it's much more likely to be by the father than by the mother. So they particularly mm -hmm. don't worry about being appealed by the mother because mothers don't have re resources for that. So so okay. legislate, we, it doesn't work to go through the legislature because the legislature doesn't really have any significant control over what the family courts do. So passing laws is, is really not that helpful. It's good as kind of a way to build your organization. But I tell people, instead of thinking I'm building this organization in order to pass this law, I encourage people to think I'm passing this law in order to help me build this organization. And then your organization mm -hmm. is going to have to carry on the fight, the long term. And the law is just going to be like a tool that you use, a little, you know, one little tool of many in your toolbox to try to demand family court reform. But family court reform, we're mostly going to get from uh, pressuring courts directly. And that means we have to expose publicly what family court judges and custody evaluators uh, and abusers, attorneys and so forth are doing. And that's what the human rights movement internationally is all about. The human rights movement internationally is about public exposure of the actions of uh, people who work for the state or, or are employed in ways that are, you know, work for the government or are employed in ways that are related to the government, what we call state actors. It's going to be through pickets, through blockades, through art projects, uh, through really the building of a mass movement. and. I've just read a book that's still in draft, unfortunately, it hasn't been published yet, of the history of the past 30 years of efforts to fight for mother's custody rights by a woman named Connie Valentine in California from the California Protective Parents Association, who's been an activist that entire time. And that book is full of, I'll try to find out when she's to think she might have that book out, but. That, yeah, I'd love to interview her. You should get sure. her on. You should get Connie Valentine on. I can connect you. That book is full of so many brilliant things that people have tried. I mean, what I thought of after reading that book is we don't need new ideas. Like that book's got every idea in it we need. What we need is 50 times the numbers. The reason that the things mm. in her book haven't worked and she keeps saying this didn't do anything, this didn't do anything, this didn't do anything. At the end of almost every chapter, it's like, oh, and this didn't do anything. Uh, it's not because they were not good enough ideas. They were excellent ideas. They didn't have big enough numbers. That's my opinion. That's my opinion. Is that that's okay. the only okay. there was nothing wrong with their strategies. They didn't have big enough numbers. And okay. so the next stage in this fight has to be about turning way more moms and their allies, both male and female. And there are a lot of male allies out there, particularly the new boyfriends or new husbands mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. often appalled by what the family court is doing to the woman. They're living it. Right. And uh, right. so there's a lot yeah. of potential allies among the new partners. The actually, I run a group right now that's well, actually, I was running it now. I've passed it off to somebody else, but that's specifically for the new partners for the you know, the men for the new partner, the non abusive men, the new partners of, of abuse, right? Women. And and oh, most wow. of those women are in custody battles, and that's a lot of why the guy is so upset that he needs a support group for himself. So, we need to cultivate way more activists and and greatly build up our numbers and focus on a very confrontational style of activism that's that's really in the court's face. And I, mm -hmm. for now, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm actually, I'm really pushing, pointing people towards an organization that's just getting going 
that's called Mothers on the Rise. I saw that it's, on uh, your Mothers website. Mothers on the Rise. Yeah. org, and that's the focus uh-huh. of that organization is to help women, not with their individual cases. We're going to have to leave that to other organizations. But Mothers on the Rise is about helping women form local groups to agitate, to do activist organizing work in your community, to try to build a broad-based national movement with much greater numbers. Oh, okay. I'm getting involved in that. that We'd we'd (laughs) love to have you. Yeah, I will absolutely, absolutely get involved in that. So just lastly, you know, we touched on the father's rights Mm. movement uh, in the very beginning, and you were saying that it's really an abuser's movement. Um, and I, I, I love that sort of putting it in that bucket <laughs> because it's so true. Talk to me a little bit, just a little bit about that and what we can do um, in the face of so, it. So, so the Father's Rights Movement grew up in response to the tremendous increase that there was in child support collection that started to happen in the late 1970s. And so the Father's Rights Movement was growing in the 1980s. And it was a response to that. In other words, it was a collection of dads who were angry about having to pay child support. Well, that already tells you who you're getting. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, it's the term father's rights is deceptive. You hear about father's rights, you think, oh, that's a good thing. Father's rights are a good thing. Mother's rights are a good thing. Children's rights are a good thing. People should have their rights. Uh, this is not a movement that's focused on father's rights. They chose that name because they wouldn't have had much success if they'd called their movement the father supremacy movement. <laughs> and the, to, to call those organizations fathers' rights organizations, to me, is like calling the Ku Klux Klan an equal rights for white people organization, right? The Ku Klux Klan is not an equal rights for white people organization. And these are not right. equal rights for fathers' organizations. Very clear when you read their materials, which I've been reading since the 1990s, they are about father supremacy. They don't, they don't want abuse allegations taken seriously, whether of domestic violence or of child sexual abuse. They do not want to have to pay child support. Uh, They do not want women to be able to leave domestic violence situations. So the whole title of the movement is fraudulent. And there are other kinds of organizations Mm -hmm. that are not part of the father's rights movement that are trying to legitimately support responsible fathers and that are trying to address fathers' concerns, like the need for family leave when children are born and and the legitimate concerns that responsible responsible fathers have. And those are those are yeah. either known as uh, father involvement organizations or responsible fatherhood organizations. Those sort of two genres. Fathers' rights. That's that's not where the good stuff is happening. Fathers' rights is is the and their literature, in addition to the sort of grievances about child support, is clearly designed primarily to recruit fathers who've been accused of abuse. Their literature is all stuff about false allegations, false allegations, false allegations, and of course. What they're really upset about is true allegations. And uh, the other thing is that they're trying to promote that what's good for children post-separation is 50-50 custody, half the time with mom, half the time with dad. There is zero evidence that that's what's best for kids. It's quite clear when you actually look at the research, that's what's best for kids post-separation. And I'm not even talking about abuse now. I'm just talking about with divorce in general. What's best for kids post-separation is a plan that looks as much as possible the way the plan looked before separation. In other words, if mom was doing 80% of the care while the family was together, then 80% time of her is what's going to be best for the kids after divorce or after separation if they weren't married. If this was one of those families where dad was truly doing 50% of the care, then a 50-50 plan might be a good plan. In the year 2022, there are still very few families where dad is truly doing 50% of the care. Fathers are doing a lot or have stepped up a lot compared to 30 or 40 years ago, but they ain't stepping up to 50%. Uh, Not nearly. According to the last research Mm -hmm. I showed, they still got miles to go towards 50%. So 50-50 custody has nothing to do with what's good for kids. That has to do with what's good for dads. Mm. Uh, But it keeps being Mm. sort of promoted. Oh, one other thing I should say is that Some people are fond of saying, well, the research shows that joint custody is what leads to the best outcomes for kids. Those research studies are of voluntary joint custody, not of mandated joint custody. Who goes into voluntary joint custody? Parents who get along. Right. So it's, first of all, it's not abuse cases. But secondly, what that means probably is that it's not even the joint custody that's leading to the good outcomes. It's the fact that the parents get along. 
that's leading to good outcomes because regardless of how much that's time right. kids are in each house, what clearly is the best for kids is when their parents like each other reasonably well and get along, which you cannot legislate. <laughs> you're not going to you're not going right. to create a law saying these parents will like each other and get along. So. Uh, state after state now is pushing for these mandatory joint custody laws. Please do everything you can to fight them. They have nothing to do with what's good for kids. And mm -hmm. uh, so we we definitely want to steer away from that and 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 get really, you know, I say this to professionals and that, that's why I'm preaching to the choir. So the next, my next comment probably doesn't even make sense to say to you. But when a dad says, oh, those courts just don't listen to dads at all and just do whatever the mother says you're pretty likely talking to someone who's ex offering a very severe distortion of what's going on because that's not, that's a very common experience for moms. That's not a common experience for dads. Once in a while, you do run into a bona fide case where dad really has been mistreated in the court. And usually it's going to be because the mom had a lot more money than he did because the court mm -hmm. does, mm -hmm. does like the parent with more money. Or, you know, or she's the one with the personality disorder or, you know, abusive tendencies, which, which they've, oddly, that's that's what they seem to favor. <laughs> right. Right. Weird. Oh, my gosh. Lundy, we really could be here. I would happily spend all day on Zoom with you. So obviously, you know, you have an incredible wealth of information out there. Your website is like a treasure trove. I mean, I could read your blogs all day. I quote them all day. I share them all Thank day. You. <laughs> and your books, you know, why does he do that? Has, I will tell you personally, it was one of the most eye opening um, experiences reading it from my own personal experience. Everyone in my group, when I shared that I was interviewing you, said, please tell him that why does he do that saved my life. So truly. Hey, thanks so much. Thanks so much for saying that. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for all of your work and lundybancroft.com, right. Is where people yes, can find right. you and, and all of the books, all of the books, people. <laughs> thank you so much, Lundy. So appreciate it. So appreciate your wisdom here. Great talking to you and, and good luck to everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of y'all and, and wishing, wishing the best for you and in, in getting free. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. If you like what you hear, head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in and leave me a review. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at the Divorce Survival Guide. I'll see you next time. And until then, remember, you, my love, deserve to be happy.